Last Friday, a 28-year-old man entered a masjid a mosque in New Zealand where Muslims had gathered, very similar, similar to us today. They congregated for the weekly Friday prayer for the khutbah. And he killed over 50 worshippers, injuring over 50 as well. He had written a 70 plus page manifesto on his beliefs, white supremacy, his support for Trump, who he can claim as a hero, and his hate for Muslims and immigrants, and how they were invaders taking over his country. The actions were recorded in a video in the style of first person shooter, like a video game. I did not watch the video and I don't encourage you to do so. And I don't encourage you to share it or look for it. Because what he wanted is for people to be afraid. He wanted to scare humiliate and annihilate those people, but also to scare people all over the world. That was his intention. Thus, by definition, he was a terrorist, because that is terrorism. It was a terrorist attack. And I was happy to know, happy to see, to observe that the biggest, the most trending hashtag on Twitter during those few days afterwards, there was a list of them, New Zealand this, New Zealand that, New Zealand lost, New Zealand. The greatest, the most trending hashtag, Sorry, hashtag on Twitter was New Zealand terrorist attack. So the global community did recognize that it was a terrorist attack, in fact. Although the media does have its double standards, and that's nothing new, it's our daily reality. You all know this. We pray that Allah accepts these victims as Shuhada, as martyrs. We have to recognize that we have a violent global culture. In this country and around the world, we have to admit to ourselves that our video games are violent, our movies are violent, our songs are violent. Our music is violent, our streets are violent, and thus how can we be so surprised that our governments are violent, and our churches and mosques and synagogues and schools are violent, our universities are violent. We shouldn't forget these instances, right? We shouldn't forget, of course, New Zealand. We also shouldn't forget the Quebec mosque shooting, January 29th, 2017, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, October 27th, 2018, which by the way was the same day at 225, so I'll never forget it. It was a day of where, where the Jewish community suffered, and really we all suffered. The Santa Fe school shooting, that's May 18, 2018, these are dates not to be forgotten. It was the day that Sabiq Sheikh, who was a Muslim in Pakistan, Israel, studying abroad from Pakistan, was killed here in Texas. And of course, New Zealand, March 14, 2019, Christchurch, massacre, terrorist attack. And of course, we can't just talk about these instances, we can't just talk about these events after they happen and mourn those who die. We have to prepare for tomorrow. We have to recognize the importance and the seriousness that comes with security. We should take security more seriously, and although I have no expertise in the matter, so I generally leave it, I just wanted to throw it out there, and others are speaking about this, so alhamdulillah, there's always a silver lining, there's always good, comes out of evil. It's important that mosques and organizations prepare for the future, because white supremacy is going anywhere, terrorist attacks aren't going anywhere, and again, we have a violent global culture. So for those who are in that position to make those decisions, I encourage Muslims everywhere to take security seriously. What I will say, and that's directly to the young Muslims, the young adults, and the high school and teenagers, the preteens, my audience, my friends and peers. What I want to say is always, for now and forever, be loud and proud about your faith. Don't internalize Islamophobia. Right? Islamophobia is the here, the hatred, and the fear, and misunderstanding and ignorance towards Muslims. But internalize Islamophobia, like internalize racism, is an internal conflict. It's something that we, especially young Muslims, internalize, we accept, we don't question enough. We start thinking and believing some of the things that we constantly being here, constantly here, being thrown at us, the insults and the, the absurd accusations and the statements. So don't internalize Islamophobia. As Malcolm X said, we declare our right on this earth to be a man, to be a human being, to be respected as such, to be respected as a human being, to be given the right of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day. Don't internalize Islamophobia. As they said, as Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X and others said, black is beautiful. This, and I've mentioned this multiple times, this made me think for a while. I was really surprised and confused and bewildered by Black is Beautiful. It's very simple, it's a few words, it's pretty popular, a slogan. But this was black leaders speaking to a black audience saying Black is Beautiful. So that surprised me, I didn't get it at first. Right, because if it was a white audience or a white leader, or you know, vice versa, it, was, it would make sense. But I didn't understand why a black leader would tell black people that Black is Beautiful. And the concept, in a nutshell, is internalized racism. When you're under the boot, you're oppressed, discriminated against for so long, as Malcolm X said, 400 years is long enough slavery and post-slavery. We're dealing with colonialism and post-colonialism, right? So we can say 500 years is long enough. But we start internalizing. When you're under the boot for so long, people have been telling you your whole life, Islam is violent, and the Prophet was of this, and you were of that, and Islam teaches this, and Islam is that. And look at ISIS and Al-Qaeda, are you with ISIS? Are you with Al-Qaeda? You can't constantly hear these things. It's natural, especially for the youth, to start internalizing at least some of this, not all of it, right? You, in fact, there are, unfortunately, Muslims that are Islamophobes, whether they recognize it or not. And I'm worried about the youth and their identity, right? So don't internalize this, right? Black is beautiful. You need to be loud and proud about who you are. 
you didn't choose your skin color, we chose our faith in Alhamdulillah, so it's not the same, but there are parallels between us and, and what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s. But it's not about race necessarily, although that's a component, right? And it might not be as militarist, as militaristic and as violent and so on as the civil rights movement and slavery, post slavery. For us, it's mostly psychological, cultural, societal. Right? So Islamophobia is very real. I don't want to internalize it. People can criticize you. People can criticize you. They can insult you. They can hurt you. They can torture and kill you. They can come up to you in your mosques, churches, synagogues, schools, and slaughter you. They can terrorize you. They can oppress you and oppress your people. They can round you up and put you in camps. They can enslave your people. They can commit war crimes and even attempt genocide against your people. All while lying to the world about what's really going on and who the real terrorists are. But nobody can stop you from being proud of who you are and what you believe. Nobody can make you feel ashamed. Only you can do that. So what do you do? How do you feel? And how do you respond? When 50 Muslims are killed, all gathered, just as we are today. For Jum'ah at a masjid, there's a few things. One is we pray for them, right? That sounds like, it sounds small. It sounds insignificant. It sounds like, you know, undervaluing the situation or not putting in your best or it sounds very similar to a phrase we've been constantly hearing in the news from those in power, those are you know, our political leaders where they just dismiss an incident or an event where they say our thoughts and prayers and they do nothing about something that they're in control of well this is something we're not really in control of, right? and we do not as Muslims devalue or undervalue or overlook prayer so we may go out and supplicate for the people that died we ask Allah to accept them as Shuhada because they were innocent and they were worshipping Allah and they were unjustly slaughtered number two we use this opportunity to educate people about Islam and Muslims. If there are positive effects, positive after effects of events like 9-11, of, of the atrocities that are ISIS, and of events like New Zealand, <coughs> the positive line is that the questions of what is Islam and who are Muslims have come to the global stage. Right? They are possibly the most frequently asked questions on the planet. If not, they're high up there. So that's an opportunity for us. It's a challenge for us. It's a window. It's Allah's mercy and wisdom, and I encourage you to discuss with friends and family and classmates and professors and teachers as best as you can, your Uber drivers if need be, those who sit on you, sit next to you on the bus, those you carpool with, everybody. Tell them about Allah, tell them about the Messenger tell them about the Quran, tell them about our community, right? Tell them about who you are and tell them about your story and where your parents are, where they came from. Everyone's talking about narratives and stories these days, right? That's like one of the buzzwords. It makes sense, right? With media and social media, it's all about you know putting forth your narrative, it's about giving people's attention. Well, we don't have a story. I don't have a story. We have the story. Right? These are the greatest stories ever told. The stories of the prophets and those who follow their footsteps from companions and disciples and scholars and the righteous and Muslims generally, right? By extension, we have the story. We have the story for humanity. We have a message for the world. So take that as an opportunity. And remember that when people throw insults at you, which will happen when you engage in discussions and debates and so on, people insult you, do your best to control your anger. Remember, you're not winning a popular contest. The prophets did not win a popular contest. You will be insulted. All sorts of weird accusations and absurd statements will be thrown at you. So do your best to remember a lot of those moments and stay calm. We're here to help people, whether we win them over or not. We're here to please Allah and we're doing our best to win hearts and minds. Right? So remember that. And number three, we remain always and forever loud and proud about our faith. Confident in our faith, full conviction. We will continue to pray, we will continue to come to the masjids, we will continue to attend Jum'ah, inshaAllah. We're not afraid, we're not ashamed, we're not full of rage, we're not full of hatred. We're not bent on vengeance, we're not fueled by hate unlike others. We recognize our right and our responsibility to protect ourselves and our families, communities, and our masjids. We remain always aware and always cognizant that even though we are peace-loving people, and we are, again, remember we spoke about Islam, internalized Islamophobia, we are peace-loving people. We're trying to spread peace all over the world. But even though we are peace-loving people, there are those who will hate us, and there are those who consider themselves our enemies. So we have to be aware of that. We understand that Allah tests the believers, and in fact, the closer you are to Allah, the more you'll be tested. So remember the big picture. Life is short, and that we will all die one day.